Hi everyone, I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy librarian at the Maine State Library. And tonight's program is the part of a continuing series on early New England records. And I'm doing something a little different tonight. Um, I wanna talk about land records. And instead of just showing you a bunch of random records, um, there's a really good case study that was done by, in two parts by two unrelated, well, distantly related, but not working with each other people. Um, the first article came out in 1988 in a small genealogy so society publication. And then someone else took that work is their base and expanded it greatly to be in the New England Historical Genealogical Register in 1994. And so this is a really good study of how you can use land records, essentially deeds with other related records like tax lists and court disputes over land boundaries and land transfers to help you figure out who your ancestors were, who they were related to, and who they would have preferred to never talk to again. And you know, neighbors, the people where you know, the, the saying about neighbor, you know, good fences make good neighbors. Come, you know, you'll see that there are a couple cases in this where um, you can see how that became a, a, a saying. Um, so. I have a, a PDF done up that I'm gonna work through on the screen. And at the end of this, I'll put it in the chat so you can download it. And um, so you can have it as a reminder of what we talked about. So anyhow, let me share my screen. There's the button. And so there are these two men in the late 1600s, early 1700s, floating around the northern end of Boston, southern end of um, Essex County, Massachusetts. And one is named T. Goberry or variations, and you'll see how many variations there are on that. And the other is named Thaddeus Berry. And so the question becomes, are these one person or two? So a couple things to look at. Um, pretty much the earliest published work on this family comes from the Essex Antiquarian, which was a, a genealogy magazine around, done in the early 1900s. And as you can see here on the screen, the people who put that together just have Thaddeus Barry lived in Boston. He married Hannah before 1665, and she was his widow in 1718. No attempt to connect him to where he came from in Europe. No attempt to connect him to anybody else. Just this random guy who has a bunch of kids. The first four are recorded in the Boston Vital Records. And the others, there's no birth record for, but they show up in other, um, one couple in the court records and a couple in, and most of them in um, his probate file. Um, it's shown that Hannah is actually Hannah Farrar. Um, there are a couple ways that was looked at. One is this daughter Ethelred, which is a very unusual name for colonial New England. If For those of you who've done a lot of research, I'm pretty sure you haven't really come across that many women named Ethelred in colonial Massachusetts. Um, that's actually her grandmother or great-grandmother's name. I think it's her great-grandmother's. Um, several of these other names, Thomas is actually the name of Hannah's father, and a couple of these others are also named for P 
people on Hannah's side of the family. As far as can be seen, um, you know, there's no, even with doing this with, is it one or two people, there's no connection to, um, any family for this man. So, but it doesn't look like any of these children are named for his side of the family. And that's actually fairly significant in colonial New England, that there doesn't at least seem to be one for his father, but there may be reasons for that. So next we'll pull out standard reference work I expect many of you have used this, Tory's New England marriages prior to 1700. And he has two entries, as you can see here, one for Teague Berry with no spouse and one for Thaddeus Berry with Hannah Farrer. And he puts them in Boston and Lynn. These are the references he gives, um, again, Estimating based on their oldest son's birth date, they were probably married by 1664 because their first son is born. Let me look at my notes here. Um, in November 1665. So the chances are pretty high that they were married no less than six months and no more than about 20 months before that. If you look at the standard, you know, obviously without a marriage record, there may have been a stillbirth or a miscarriage before that, or a child who died young that there's no record of. Um, but um, you can pretty much guesstimate that that's when they were married, which probably means he was born 16, if, if she's his first wife, he was probably born 1640, maybe as early as 1635, but 1640 is a good guess. And here, um, this is the manuscript version of Tory's marriages, um, just so you can see, let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it. Um, is it American Ancestors? It's not indexed. You have to search for it and then you have to search for the volume that's the first letter of the last name and then you work your way through it. But again, here you see he's got Teague Barry with nobody. And you know, this is all secondary. He was, he, he's just pulling and you can see the references here that come up here that, and I'm gonna talk about, I've already talked about the Essex Antiquarian. I'm gonna talk about the flag book in a minute. And so this is, what you've got here. This is um, a book that's the documentary history of Chelsea, the town in Massachusetts. Um, and it, it has a whole lot. He really, um, Chamberlain for the most part, he speculates that there's a link between Teague and Thad Thaddeus, but doesn't really talk about it anymore doesn't try to prove it or anything like that. Um, so then next we have flags, genealogical notes on the founding of New England. And he has the interesting idea that Teague is the father of Thaddeus. And so, um, and divides him here, you, know, you have, Teague Barry and the wife of Teague Barry with no information, which is where Tory got that. And then you have a Thaddeus marrying Hannah. And it says the other children of Teague Barry, if he had any, are not known to the writer. Very little is known about him. So he's saying that there's two separate people and their father and son. Um, and he speculates, he says that it is said he was an Irishman, but if so, he was an exception to the rule that all the Puritan immigrants to New England were pure English extraction. Well, here's the interesting part. 
at that time in Ireland, Teague would have been an anglicized version of a Gaelic name and it would have been a Catholic name. And so there's a good chance that Teague O'Berry or whatever his original name was, was Irish Catholic. And one of the things you have to remember at this point is in the English colonies, there's very little toleration for Catholicism. To the point that, you know, we were taught in school that Maryland was the refuge for Catholic refugees from England. And so I was interested and I, so I looked this up and it's interesting that in this time period of the, the late mid to late 1600s, the Catholic population of Maryland was at most 10%. And actually in 1650, there was a Puritan um, basically takeover of the colonial government. And it it was only a later, about 10 years later, that the Calvert family took it back over. And then by 1688, with changes in England, Catholicism comes close to being outlawed in Maryland. And so in this time period, and it, it was actually you know, outlawed hard to, you know, they had rules against corporate ownership of land. So religious orders couldn't buy, you know, a monastery couldn't exist. Um, there were restrictions on Catholic sacraments. You couldn't have Catholic schools. So basically at this time period, there, the only way to be openly Catholic comfortably in North America was to go to New France or New Spain. And you know, New England, the Mid-Atlantic, not really welcoming of Catholics to any great extent. So if that's the case, and Tigo Berry is actually Irish Catholic, he has pretty good incentive for transforming himself into Puritan or Protestant Thaddeus Berry, because there wouldn't have been many other Catholics around. Um, so he has some incentive um, at this point. But anyway, so, so here we have Flagg who has them as father and son. And then we get, we also take a look at the history of the town of Revere by Benjamin Shirtleff, who says they're the same person, Teague and Thaddeus, but I keep having to move the cat. So if I, you hear weird sounds, it's me moving the cat off the um, monitor stand so I don't knock my monitor over. Um, but he doesn't show any evidence that Thaddeus and Teague were the same person. Um, so then you do get a woman named um, Marsha Wiswell Lindbergh writing in 1988, and she does have a bunch of evidence. And this is what I'm gonna work through to show you this. And then a, a Michael Hager, a few years later does the longer article in the register. So just so you can see what we're talking about, this is from Lindbergh's article. Um, and the land that is at the focus of most of this is up in this area. Um, here, and I'm, in a minute I'll show you you know, we're, we're north of Boston. Um, let me show you the modern map. For those of you who know the Boston area at all, you know the horrendous rotary on Route 60 in Revere going down to Logan Airport? That's right here at the bottom of the screen. So if you're coming going from Maine down to Logan, you come down this way on one and you get off here, and go down and do that rotary that is notorious. And the land we're talking about is up in this area, right around the river here, where a bunch of, where Saugus and a couple other, in Boston and, and 
I guess this is, is this lid up here come together? So this is the area we're talking about that um, is going to show that these were actually the same man, okay? So does this, you know, just so you have an idea where we are for those, you know, and here's the satellite image. And a lot of this is still undeveloped because it's marshland, but there was an area right in here before suburban development that was evidently because it was near all of this marsh, it was actually rich agricultural land. So some of this area was actually pretty valuable. Um, you know, it was far enough up that the river wasn't overflowing that much um, with hurricanes and such. And, but you had enough water that it was a rich, it, you know, it was a good soil. Um, so just so you see, those of you who didn't you know, know the Boston area, know the area we're talking about. So anyway, so here's a, a, an overview of these secondary sources that I just went through. Um, and I basically have this here. So when you get the PDF, it gives you the nice summary of what there is. And so one of the issues, and I talked about this in an earlier program, when you're dealing with people in colonial New England, you often get a lot of these things where there's genealogy work that was done 100, 125 years ago that wasn't as rigorous as what we do now. And so those things are the things people find. You know, people find these first few um, things online. These are all available easily. Um, these first three are, the first two are out of copyright. The next two are still in copyright, but they're free at Family Search. So you get those first four, but yeah, four, sorry, um, easily found. And you will have had people who did early, for those of you who've been around a while, the precursor to the online trees was the um, Mormons, you know, the, the Family History Library's ancestral file, which was an early attempt at a one world tree. And that started before, right around the time Lindbergh, just after, in, in the timeline where you get the research by Lindbergh and Hager. But you also have people who found stuff online in the late 1990s, put it in their own stuff and it's kept propagating through the online world because people don't go back and fix it. So half an hour, well, an hour ago at this point, I went to Family Search and we still have in their one world tree where they're making an effort to have only one per entry per person. You still have Thaddeus O'Berry with the spouse Hannah Farrar and then son Thomas with the same wife, going back to what Flag had somewhat. Um, this is actually a corruption of what Flag had, but it's this is why you need to be really careful when you're looking at secondary sources for colonial New England, is you do get a lot of this bad work propagated. So here's where it gets really interesting. So what I did is I went through both Wiswell's Lindbergh's article and Hager's article and pulled out the dates and what record they were talking about and put them in order. Because even in these articles, there was some jumping back and forth as they were trying to prove different pieces. And again, so this is a very simple timeline and all it has is I've got a date, so they're in order. The name that you get for this target person or two people, and then the record it's from. And so here's one of the things that's interesting is you, you get, and I think this is probably because it's a church record, 
you've got early work as with Thaddeus Barry, and then you get some records with variations on Teague O'Barry. You get him serving in King, King Philip's War as Thaddeus. You get him, look at these variations, Teague up Baron. Although this is from a, um, a published source, these tax records have been published. I'm gonna show you shortly. I don't know that the, the originals still exist um, to go back because I wouldn't be surprised if that N is really supposed to be a U, that the up barrow would fit in more with some of these others. But again, you see here we have, um, he's buying this land in the north part of Boston called Romney Marsh. A year later, his land is used as one of the descriptors of the boundaries of land given to an Elisha Bennett by his parents, Samuel and Sarah Bennett, who were the ones who sold this land to Teague or Thaddeus. Um, and then again, in 1674, there's another deed confirming the 1672 deed and that they acknowledge they no longer have a right to the land. And one of the interesting things on this is that one of the witnesses is actually Hannah's father. And that's part of the puzzle that helped figure out what her surname was. I'm not gonna go into the other parts of how that was proven because that's a whole nother case study. And then what's really, look at this, these, the Essex County Quarterly Court, there was a case between Teague and this man named John Paul. And look at all of the ways his name was spelled in one court case. So you know how I often say spelling doesn't count? Here's the proof. Spelling does not count in genealogy. Um, I'm gonna show you the, these Essex quarterly courts for the, there's a short period. There's, the early ones are published. The later ones are available online. And there's like a five year gap in between where only the summary volume is available online and all of the you know, backup data attachments evidence is still only in manuscript form. And as much as I would have loved to go down to the Essex Institute or PBD Essex Museum that it now is um, and look at that for this presentation, state of the world is such that I was not able to do that. If I ever do this presentation again, I plan to go down and look at the originals. Um, but again, you get, um, but you'll notice that you've got him taxed with these names that are the variations on the T Goberry. And then just a few years later, you get Thaddeus Barrow taxed on the same land for some, and then he sells part of the land actually gives part of the land to his son, Thomas, with the agreement that Thaddeus and Hannah will have a life interest in it being able to stay on the, in the house and on the land. And I'm gonna show you that record to, you know, so you can see what happens with that. Um, so Thomas pays the, the taxes one year, and then we go back to having Theodorus Barry, and again, this is a published one um, in that same one, same um, series as this one with the Up Baron. So I think there's a chance that this actually was me meant to be closer to Thaddeus instead of Theodorus, and it just got misread. And then when um, Thaddeus dies, his son, John, is the administrator of the estate. And it takes a couple of years to settle everything. As you can see here, Hannah gets her widow's third, 
which you know I talked about back when we talked about probate. But again, there, there are descriptions in some of this and later deeds that confirm that this is the same land that Thaddeus Berry's estate is dealing with that was bought by Tigo Berry 35 to 50 years earlier. Um, and so that you, know, you have this going back and forth with the different names. And so it, to me, it's pretty convincing that they are the same person. Um, you know, with, with the incentive to de-Irish eyes his name as much as an incentive to anglicize it. Um, and this consistency of, of things where he's, you know, it's all revolving around the same plot of land, the taxes, the will, the court case, and the, um, the deeds, you know, this is all around the same piece of land that is quite well defined in a couple of these documents. And so this is a case where this problem of, you know, how many men were there with, and what was their name? And it turns out it's one man with a wife, Hannah, and he seems to have left, led a, a reason, of, not necessarily, he wasn't rich, but he wasn't poor either. One of the things you'll see, he, he didn't have a huge plot of land compared to some of his neighbors, but he did own land, which, you know, if, if he were Irish Catholic, he would have never been able to do in Ireland. So, you know, he's, um, I think there's probably a good chance in his mind, you know, there was the French king who said Paris is worth a mass. I'm guessing this guy thought sort of the opposite that, you know, um, giving up the mass in order to have this land and a comfortable lifestyle and his children who survived to adulthood all married into very prosperous families from the area. So, you know, he did well for himself. If he did, there's been speculation about he, how he ended up in New England and there, there are no good, there's no good evidence for any of that. So as I said, you know, this one, all the documents that come around this one piece of land show that this is indeed one person. And you're getting, you know, I'm guessing he still had an Irish accent. And given that spelling didn't really matter that much anyway, <laughs> this is what you end up with is, you know, people were often more flexible about their names than they are now. So I'm going to stop sharing this one. And go into in the internet. And share my screen again. So I can walk you through some of this. Um, this is a probate record. Um, and it's not the topic of tonight, but I wanted to start with it because it is, it does, um, it has the advantage that it names all the children. Um, he's in the record as Thaddeus Barry, but at points in this, it references the piece of land bought from Samuel Bennett, and which was bought under the name of Tigo Barry or variants thereof. And so, you know, if you're researching somebody, you know, I think I've told you already, you know, if they've got a probate file, it's a really good place to start in the era before censuses, because it gives you that usually a relatively complete snapshot of the family at the time, because you will get the inventory and it's somewhere in all of this where, you know, it mentions the land. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot here. Um, he died without a will, which often leaves a larger probate file in some ways because they have to figure out what he's got to in his estate to be distributed. Um, 
So that's, um, you know, and he's, you can see it's taking time. It takes about two years to get his estate settled. And, you know, that's always good for genealogists because if there's a long drawn out process, it generates records. So let's take a look at, um, so here's the Suffolk deeds. Oh no, so this is still more, I'm sorry, this is still more of the probate. Um, and as you can see, you've got um, somewhere in here, there's a mention, again, there's a mention of the value of the land and where it was bought from. Um, all right, so now we're looking at, now the early Suffolk County deeds have been transcribed. Um, and so that's what I pulled up. And here you have that Samuel Bennett of Romney Marsh in the limits of Boston, in the colony of Massachusetts in New England, um, you know, six pounds of current money of New England um, to me well and truly paid by Teague Abero of Romney Marsh. So some of the speculation is that one of two things happened here. Teague is already living in Romney Marsh when he buys this land. So there's some thought that he'd rented from Samuel Bennett for a couple of years before he bought the property. Or the other is that he'd owned previous property and the deed was never filed. And so it doesn't survive because not all deeds were filed. You can have people, and I have run into cases where, you know, I find a deed where someone's selling land and they never registered the deed where they bought it. Um, that's often true if you get people inheriting land, they won't bother to file a new deed um, in this time period until they go to sell the land and the new buyer wants the deed recorded. And as you can see, you get the whole description of the property. Um, which you know, is very much, you know, there's no way you could reconstruct this now. Unlike you know, when I talked about um, land records out West in a previous one of these, um, you know, where you get the nice grid system where each part, part of parcel of land has a, um, a designation in a grid system. New England didn't do that. And so you get the meets and bounds description from maple tree to a heap of stones, um, to rock, towards the rocks, to a walnut stump. Um, so as you can see, there's no way you could go reconstruct this now. Um, and they do have in here, it's interesting, things about being having access to, um, somewhere down here, there's an, access to the river. Um, uh, uh, so that's a, a good thing. Now this one, if I remember correctly, does not have Bennett's wife signing off on her dower. Um, but you do see that in some of these. Um, and actually I, I made note of one, so I will show it to you. Uh, where was it? <sighs> Image 240. So we'll go to that in a minute. Um, but again, you get witnesses. These are often people who are in somehow connected to the people here. Um, this William Hawthorne, is an ancestor of Nathaniel. And you can also see here um, the double F instead of a capital F that was common at the time when it was the first letter in a word. And so this, this is not a woman named Grace, it's a man named Free Grace. Um, and you'll see him, he's the recorder. So he's here at the end of a lot of these. 
Um, so let's just go to image 240 for a minute so I can show you what it looks like when a woman signs off on her dower right. Is this the right? There we go. And Ruth, the wife of me, the said William Parsons, doth by these presents freely and fully and absolutely give yield up and surrender all her right title, dower, and interest, which she hath might or should have had up and, and to the above mentioned premises or to any part or parts thereof, and so on. And so you know, this is often, you know, this is basically saying that widow's third that Hannah gets at the settlement of um, Thaddeus's estate in this case, Ruth is saying that she is giving that up on this land, you know, that she's agreeing to the free sale of the entire land. Um, so I just wanted to point one of those out to you that that is something you will sometimes see. And often what it is, is it's a case of if, in this case, they were probably selling the land that they were living on to give up the dower, whereas the land that Bennett sold to Barry may well not have been the land they were living on. Um, there's, it's not a hard and fast rule, but there's a sort of more likely than not that case. Um, so that's just something for you to see. Um, so then we'll go on here, come on. Um, so this is the later sale um, this is that confirming deed and these are not I don't see these that often um, but you do see them sometimes and it may be a case that they were doing some selling other land there may have been some probate issues in the Bennett family um, there may have been something where, you know, other things with, with their mother's dower and all sorts of things like that. Um, and as you can see, this is a, a short one. It's just saying, yeah, we, we acknowledge that our father set, sold this land free and clear to this other person. Um, I've seen some cases where I'm pretty sure what happened is that the um, the original deed that they could carry with them, they lost and they do this to get another piece of paper that's not in the book at the county courthouse. Um, I've often, I've also seen these a couple times in places not in New England, instead of redoing a whole deed, if a courthouse burns, I've occasionally seen them just doing these confirming deeds that people, that the book says, so-and-so brought in their deed, we're confirming it and we'll write it down in the new post burn book. Um, so these are a little unusual, but they do happen. And I think some of this may have been, there wasn't, I told you, you know, in, in the, in between, Teague buying the land and this confirming deed, the Bennetts did sell or give some land to one of their sons. And so that may have all to, to, to Elisha. So that some of this may be dealing with that transaction as well, but it certainly gives you, um, if you're doing something where you're working to figure out something where there aren't a lot of records, just having another data point with people's names can be helpful. So let's take a look here on this one, come on. So this is then when um, Thaddeus gives land, well Thaddeus and, and um, Hannah, give land to their son, um, Thomas, named for Hannah's father. 
And as you can see, this is a long one. Um, and basically it's laying out the conditions that he ha owns the property, he can improve it. He's gonna pay for improvements. It's his land and so on, but we're retaining the right to live here. And he's going to give us certain things. We're basically giving him the land. We're not selling it to him, but he's going to do certain things in exchange in terms of providing um, some food and, and firewood and such for us for the rest of our lives. Does that make sense how that's different than a full sale? That, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a deed of gift with conditions. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not just an outright, this is your land, you can do whatever you want with it. It's, this is your land, but you need to do these things in exchange. And these are not that unusual as a way of conveying where the parents were living to a child before a probate file is dealing with it. And it's, before social security, it was a way of making sure that you know, the land stayed in the family and that the parents were provided for. You know, basically, this is Thomas agreeing that he's gonna care for his parents in exchange for their house. Which, you know, I can see why they did this at this point instead of the kids fighting over things after they died. So I just wanted to, you know, and you can see this is unlike the confirming deed, this is detailed and long. So one of the other things was the tax records. Um, oh, this is just a list of residents this first one. And again, this was transcribed, um, this one in, in 1876. This whole series of Boston records was done in the late 1800s. I don't know whether, I, had, I forgot to look up whether the originals exist. Um, they are a mess to find things in. I will tell you right now. Um, there's seemingly no order to, what documents ended up in which, I mean, there is some order, but it's not obvious just looking at the books to begin with. So anyway, so here's a list of the people living in, in Romney Marsh, that area of um, Boston. And it's telling us um, basically how much they have that's taxable. And so if we look down here, here we have Theodorus Barry, one head. So he's, there's one adult male living in the house at this point, two oxen, two cows, houses and lands, four acres. And so that's what he would have owed tax on at this point. And um, so here you have Edward Tuttle, Two heads, so two adult males living in the house, two oxen, six cows, 20 sheep, um, one mare, houses, upland, which often refers to, you know, woodland or other, not as easily, it's, it's useful land, but not fields or meadows. And then he has a meadow and he has 80 acres. Um, here's someone who is renting. Um, and actually it's not clear from this rent, if he's renting his farm or if he's renting out land that he gets 30 pounds rent a year. I'm guessing it's that he's getting 30 pounds on lands he owns. And so they're taxing him for that rather than the renter being, because at this point, most, taxes you're going to find in New England are based either on the number of adult males in a household or on the property owned. Um, so here you see 
these are probably people who are renting or living with another family, but they're not, they don't own anything. So, um, and as you can see, slavery was um, allowed at this point in Massachusetts. Um, so, but this gives you an idea. One nice thing about this list is it does let you see what his neighbors would have had and how did he compare. So um, his, his land wasn't that big compared to most of these. Um, and just to show you some of the others, here's one from 1681. And here he is. is Here's, here's the one where he's Teague up barren. Um, and then we have this one for this year, interestingly, and this is hard to read because this is for um, Romney Marsh again. And this for this year, which is 16, 87, I think. Um, they did a, evidently whoever recorded the taxes, instead of writing it out the way they'd done in, in that previous one, they've done a chart of the heads, meaning the adult males in the household, you know, farmable land and meadow, pasture land, and then the various types of, um, other things that they were, and then the, this is the amount they were due in taxes. Um, and as you can see, there are only two people on this page who owed as much as the full pound in taxes. Um, Teague owed three shillings and six pence, um, which is not the lowest on the page, but it's close to it because um, Someone here only owned owed eight pence. Um, so then we go back to um, here's Romney Marsh again, and you, he's in here somewhere. I found him. Oh, where is he? There he is, Tigo. And this trip is not that unusual with the if with the O from a, an Irish last name getting shoved into the first name in um, colonial New England for the few Irishmen, Irish people who came with a name starting with O. Um, and this is one that's interesting. This is a list of inhabitants. It's not a tax list, but it's basically saying here are the people who live here. And What's interesting is that when they put this together, they decided to alphabetize it by what I call 19th century alphabetizing, which I'll show you more in a minute. And then they arranged it by ward. So instead of arranging it, you know, I think most of us in modern times would say you arrange it by ward and then alphabetically, they did it alphabetically and then by ward. And if you look here, and I'll show you where our friend Thaddeus is. Um, he's here in Ward 9. And what I mean by 18th or 19th century alphabetizing is they didn't look past the first letter. So you have all the Bs lumped together, but they don't put, you know, and I had to remind myself when I went into this to look for him that he, you know, I was like, oh, Belchar, he's not, no, he's down there because all they cared about was the first letter, but it's more than they've done in the 18th century. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, and then this one, this is the summary of that court case around the land. Um, And T. Goberry won. And then 
he in the county court and then the next court was the court of assistance and so he john paul took it to the next court and in that one where we get yet another spelling of his first name the court upheld the lower one in Teague's favor. Um, and so what's interesting is you get the, um, the jury here, you just get the summary, um, but it, it does tell you that that much. Um, and as I said, these, this one, um, again, you know, there were more documents and they're referred to in here, but th for this era, this is all that's online is the summary. And then finally, I'm gonna show you if it comes up. Um, several years after the various controversies and giving land to his son, he has some other land that's at this point in Lynn so this is actually in the Essex County deeds because even though he lives in Boston in Suffolk County, the deed is registered where the land was, not where the person lived, which is the primary reason I wanted to show you this is um, to make that point that, you know, if, if you have somebody who's living in say Auburn, Maine, and inherits land from a sibling in Lewiston, the deed will be in Lewiston, not in Auburn. Does that make sense to everybody? You know, the, the deed is where the, the land actually is. And again, you have um, the description of the land he's selling, how much was paid for it, um, and so on. Um, and he, this also shows you Thaddeus Barry, his mark, he's not able to write his name. Um, and one of the interesting things here is one of the witnesses is actually his daughter, Elizabeth, which is rather interesting for the time period. Um, so, Again, these are on most of the Massachusetts land records for this era are online. Early Maine deeds are online. Um, for Massachusetts, the, the Essex ones are both at Family Search and at an Essex County um, deed office. And I find I use both of them at various points. Um, if I don't have a reference already to a particular date and deed and the page it's on, I find that the search at the Essex County deeds is easier than the going through the microfilmed indexes at Family Search. Um, but Family Search has more tools for manipulating the image and saving it and things like that. You know, the, the Essex County Deeds is a site that's aimed at current title searchers and, and real estate lawyers and all of that, rather than genealogists. Um, but the early records are online. So let me stop sharing my screen. And any questions at this point? I know I've thrown a lot of information at you um, and I'll go back over some of this next week and do a little more of looking at things by type. But I was hoping that sort of looking at this one case of how these two researchers proved that these two men were the same person can show you why it's worth looking at land records. Cause you do, you know, you do get relationships mentioned, you get, um, you get cases where, you know, it mentions, you know, the, the deed is for Lynn, but it mentions that somebody involved in the, inter 
interaction is in the transaction lives in Boston and things like that that can help you place your ancestor um, either in a family or in a geographic location. So I have a question, Jay. Sure. Um, does that you were showing Essex County? Does it have other counties in Massachusetts and different? Yes, states? almost all of the early, you know, the early. Um, let me show you. Let me start show my screen again. So here you see the counties. And so if I wanted to look for something in Middlesex, I'd click here. And you can see these are the indexes. And for Middlesex County, they start in 1649. And if we click here, this is, come on, yeah, you can do it. Um, you, you, know, you get, you know, this is the best image they could get at the time. And that's one of the other reasons it's nice to know that many of these are also, also online at the county deed site website because the other thing I found is sometimes one has a better image than the other. And so um, if you've looked at family search and you can't read it, then go to see if Middlesex, I don't know, I haven't looked at Middlesex County. I've only worked with Suffolk and Essex County and with the York County, York and Cumberland in Maine. Um, but, you know, you can, um, but as, as you saw, it, it's got all the counties and it goes back to the beginning there. Any other questions? Yeah, one of the things I plan to do next week is to walk you through using one of the county websites because they're not always the most intuitive. Um, because again, they're use, they're really aimed at people who are using them for current professional reasons. And so having a, a less simple website isn't necessarily something they're aiming for. Whereas, you know, the genealogy websites are trying to make it easy for you to use. Um, so any other questions? And before I forget, let me pull up the chat and send out the PDF. So if you look in the chat, and if you don't know where the chat is, if you put your cursor over anywhere near the pictures of people, you'll get a menu down at the bottom. And one of them, on my screen, it's the one just to the left of the, well, you probably don't have the share screen, but it looks like a little cartoon bubble. And if you click on that, you should see the chat. Yes, yeah, Steve, you're right. It is Lewis and Alvin are both in Androscoggin. So I used the wrong. <laughs> yeah, although there are a couple um, states in New England that do things at the town level. I think Rhode Island does both probate and deed. I, I'll double check on that. I have that in. I have that in the list of things to put in next week. Is you know where you find them in the different New England states. Um, so. Any other can questions? I a, can I make a comment about uh, it, trying to find uh, different counties in Maine? Uh, we've we've done some property uh, buildings, for example, in uh, Farmington one time, but we couldn't find the deed, the original work, 
before we finally we realized that Franklin County was where Farmington is used to be a Kennebec County. And we ended up finding the deed in Kennebec County. And I think that that's happened probably more than once uh, in people that are trying to work within Maine. I think the county's changed around a bit. Yeah, particularly early on. Right. And that's one of the things I'll talk about next week, Mary. But good point. Um, you know, well, when, a on, when a county splits planning. off, they don't get the old records. Well, I've been on planning boards recently, and I find that these records, they're still doing the same kind of thing in the boonies. Yeah. yeah, but at least here, at least now, most people record their deeds. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, I think that's exactly. Um, J Jan put in the um, boundaries. Um, that's actually what I was going to talk about next week. Is that the utility of that tool? And yeah, maybe it's Connecticut, not Rhode Island. I, I have to look. I know that there are a couple that do things by city or town um, in ways that the rest of New the country mostly does by county. But yeah, that, that Newbury um, historic county boundaries is great. It, it has saved my sanity more than once. <laughs> I can tell you. Um, there's also a book we have in the library. Um, yeah, to get to the family search ones, you... Um, you search by location, by the county name, and then under land records. And I'll cover that again more next week or the week after when I get, I don't think I'm gonna get everything left in next week. I think this is gonna be a three, a three episode sub-series within the entire colonial New England. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. Um, the land records were well kept, are probably the most well, more than probate or just about anything else, are some of the most well kept records in New England. And one advantage in New England over some other places is there were relatively few courthouse fires here. You know, there are places in the South where you know, courthouses seem to burn every 17 years, but here in New England, there are very few cases of that. So um, they are available here. Um, and as, so I hope I showed you at least why they're helpful to use. So any other questions? Okay, at that point, I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>